Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. Each fall, it has become a tradition on this program for two weeks to invite four of my colleagues from North Idaho College to discuss with you what is called book talk. I've enjoyed this so much over the years, I look forward to every fall when we can do it again, and, and that is the purpose of the program today and next week. The official title of today's program is Book Talk, a look at major non-fictional works, and our four guests have spent the summer doing extensive reading, and they're here and, and are so cooperative to do that. We welcome back from last year at our program, first of all, Denise Clark, who is a North Idaho College librarian, and I call her the walk-in encyclopedia. She certainly can find anything for you in the field of publications. And next to her, an equally very intelligent person, Dr. Virginia Tinsley Johnson, who chairs the North Idaho College Department of Communication and Fine Arts, and one year was chosen as the faculty member of the year in the United States for community colleges. And then our third guest, a great friend and someone who's been on the faculty a long time and is very, very articulate and an extensive reader is Fran Barr from the English faculty. And next to her is our other friend, Annie McKinley, who uh, is remarkable in her outreach and, and understanding of books too. And she's with our speech faculty. Welcome to all four of you. It's always great to have you here. Uh, not to lose any time, we have so much to talk about. Uh, we're going to start our first uh, question to Fran Barr. Fran, uh, we'd love to let our viewers know what are some of the outstanding works, and we'll start with you with your recommendation, and, and if you would do something on the content of uh, a non-fictional book, please. Okay. Well, probably my favorite non-fiction book I read recently is uh, Dress Your Family in Corduroy and Denim. It's by David Sedaris, who is quickly becoming one of the most popular um, personal essayists in the country. He's, um, I think I first heard him on National Public Radio. Uh, he is a regular commentator, and his name just kind of slipped in my subconsciousness. And then Virginia Johnson said, oh, you've got to read David Sedaris a couple of years ago. And so since then, I've read Me Talk Pretty One Day, which is one of his collections. Another one is Naked. And now he's come out most recently with Dress Your Family in Corduroy and Denim. Now, the thing I find interesting about David Sedaris is he talks about very typical personal incidents, but um, somehow he is able to elevate it in a way with humor and with um, with a lot of emo emotion emotion and uh, what happens is is that they are bigger and somehow express what we all feel um, my English 101 students that's freshman composition uh, I give them readings and it can just be absolutely terrible for them to trudge through them well, this year I had them read a Davis Sedaris piece, and they came in and couldn't say enough about it. Uh, two or three of them said they ended up crying. Oh my! By the time they finished reading, it was about the death of his mother. She got cancer, but it was different. It was it was better. Um, what I want to do is read to you just one piece out of this particular book. Um, this essay is called Put a Lid on It, and it is one of his more humorous ones, maybe not as deep, but this will give you a flavor of what he writes about. He says, in a bathroom at LaGuardia Airport, I watched a man take a cell phone from his jacket pocket, step into an empty stall, and proceed to dial. I assumed he was going to pee and talk at the same time, but looking at the space beneath the door, I saw that his pants were gathered about his ankles. He was sitting on the toilet. <laughs> Most airport calls begin with geography. Oh, I'm in Kansas City, people say. I'm in Houston. I'm at Kennedy. When asked where he was, the man on the phone said simply, I'm at the airport. What do you think? The sounds of a public toilet are not the sounds one would generally associate with an airport, at least not a secure airport, and so his what do you think struck me as unfair. The person he was talking to obviously felt the same way. What do you mean, what airport, the man said. I'm at LaGuardia. Now put me through to Marty. 
Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very colorful. Yes. Thank you very much. It's wonderful. We might have time to come back, and we're going to go to Annie McKinley next and uh, pick one of your books and tell us oh, why okay. you were so impressed with it. Mr. Just on a sideline, David Sedaris is going to be at the Get Lit Conference in April and uh, through Eastern. If you want to go hear him, um, I chose on a um, different note. I chose Helen Thomas's book, Front Row at the White House. Well, that's for a long time, like 50 years or so. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's like, well, I'll have to say that some of the presidents she talked about, the first president she talked about, I was in the fifth grade when he was president. So you do your <laughs> math there. And anyway, um, I originally heard about this book from a good friend of mine who's my mother's best friend. It's been my mother's best friend for about 60, 70 years. And she's 87 years old, and she does a lot of reading. And she said, you've got to read this book. you just got to read this book. So, of course, I kind of poo-pooed it because I don't know why I did. But anyway, so I finally picked it up, and I couldn't put it down. She is an amazing writer. And if you if, if Helen Thomas was the press secretary and started out in the Kennedy administration and is still there in our current administration, and she starts and f stops the uh, press conferences. She gets the first question every time. Uh, no political comment there, but used to get the first press call co <laughs> every time. Okay. So, and so her comments and her visions are so interesting because she has a whole section just on the First Ladies and how she viewed the First Ladies. <coughs> so it gives you a different uh, look at the First Ladies and their different projects and how they protected their press, their, their uh, yeah. husbands and she starts in the Kennedy administration yeah. and do you have a quote from that particular book or um, the only quote that I can and I showed this with my mass media class the other day is because they talk about how the press has changed in the White House and this is true about her relationship with each of the presidents and it has changed um, over the years and somebody and asked her once why she did not ever report on um, the Kennedy, you know, affairs right. or his personal life, and she said it used to be that the presidents had a personal life. Mm -hmm. What was private was private. Mm -hmm. She said now it's like everything is game. And she said, if you want to be president, you better decide when you're five years old and start at that point. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we better, uh, and time is so precious. And precious. But how about the second book before we go the to the other two guests? The second book um, is a little bit different. This is Under the Banner of Heaven um, by John Cock Cocker, assuming I pronounced that right. Craig Kelly? Yeah. Okay. And this one talks about the fundamentalist um, Mormon movement in the United States. And it, um, it's also very interesting. It's a, the premise of it is about, um, I'll just read the front cover here. On July 24th, 1984, a woman and her infant daughter were murdered by two brothers who believed that they were ordered by God uh, by, to kill by God. The roots of his, the crime lie deep in the history of American religious practice by millions. So it talks about the fundamental uh, Mormon movement. Uh, interesting uh, cities and uh, towns in the United States where the Young women are not allowed to read newspapers or watch television, and they're married off at 14 to as a spiritual wife. And it's an incredible story. But, uh, but to be very clear and fair, that certainly doesn't, it's not a stereotype of any particular group of people or religion. No. 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 So I want to make that very clear that that's not. No. Not, it's not. Uh, In fact, um, I found it also fascinating about even that they start of the Mormon church in the United States and how they were persecuted and how they were, people would go into the towns where the Mormons were and just slaughter them and then yeah. blame it on the yes. uh, Indians coming to. Uh, the people that belong to the LDS faith have had faced great discrimination as Native Americans did and others, mm -hmm. particularly on their way west and, and many great, great members of that religion. Uh, we want to turn to, uh, I guess next is Denise Clark and Denise, uh, how about your nonfiction book? Well, um, the first one I'm going to talk about is one by Rosamond Purcell called Owl's Head. And uh, Rosamond is b mainly known as a photographer. In fact, uh, there is one woman uh, whose name I've forgotten who referred to her as the doyen of decay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she, she loves going into natural uh, science, natural science museums, and taking pictures of various specimens in jars, interesting anatomical <laughs> specimens in jars. She also does uh, stuffed birds, um, skeletons. She, she really, she's a very fine natural science photographer. Uh, she's worked with Stephen Jay Gould, for example. She was teaching a photography class in uh, Maine, in, just outside of Owl's Head, Maine, a very small community, and a friend told her she's, uh, that she needed to go to um, Buck, uh, Buckminster's um, 
a dump pile, actually, a garbage dump, uh, Mr. Buckminster has been collecting stuff, say stuff, for um, probably over 50 years. And the stuff has literally moved him out of his house. The stuff is piled um, <laughs> you know, above his head, all around his acreage. And um, she, she develops a, kind of a passion for some of the, the natural processes that, it ha that have a, that's occurred to some of this stuff on Mr. Buckminster's property. So she hauls off books and various uh, stages of decay, of which she uses as photography samples. But the book is a chronicle of her relationship with Buckminster, Mr. Buckminster. Uh, and again, on time, do you have any quote from that particular book that you want to read? Uh, well, this is, uh, this is interesting right here. Uh, I am a collector, right. I have to admit. I, so I was passionately interested in this book. <laughs> um, this is, at the time, I was both fascinated and shocked by she is looking at this group of books by the condition of the disinterred books. They confirmed a collusion between willful neglect and the indifference of nature. I wanted to acquire the lot because it was full of visual incident. As I am descended from generations of collectors on both sides of the family, perhaps by genetic default, I was in the throes that day of becoming a collector myself. <laughs> what she does, she hauls off trash from Mr. Buckminster's property by the truckload. <laughs> How about a second book? Uh, you got, uh, oh, uh, I have three here. The, uh, another one I'd like to mention is one called Father Joe, the Man Who Saved My Soul by Tony Hendra. Uh, Tony Hendra was one of the editors of National Lampoon, uh, for example. He was Spy Magazine, also Spy. He was one of the editors of Spy. And he has a very interesting relationship with a priest throughout his entire life. Now, Mr. Hendra has his ups and downs, but Father Joe remains his rock. And I would like to just read um, a short passage from the beginning of this book to kind of give you a, a, a This is how Tony Hendra feels, feels about Father Joe. He visits him fairly frequently throughout his life. Um, it, this is his description. There he stands on the muddy clay of the little promontory, hands under scapular for warmth in the chill, his wide, rubbery mouth beaming serenely at the gray turmoil of the English Channel. Hooked over vast ears, framing a fleshy groundhog nose and battered granny glasses <laughs> is his black monk's cowl, ancient and rudimentary shield against the blustery rain. Farther down, irredeemably flat feet in black socks and big floppy sandals, these emerging from scruffy black robes whipped by the squall squalls and revealing, if you're lucky, glimpses of white English knees so knobby they could win prizes. <laughs> Dom Joseph Werelo is his formal monastic name, but everyone calls him Father Joe. I have seen him in this pose and place countless times down the years, in the flesh or in my mind's eye. Never once have I been able to stop a smile from coming to my lips. He is as close to a cartoon monk as you could imagine, and he is a saint. Oh. Yeah, I, every time we do these programs, I just marvel at the power of words that these authors are so gifted. They, uh, we who are not as of the great amount of gift that they are, just sit here and marvel at <laughs> their ability to communicate. And now to Virginia Johnson, who does extensive reading. And Virginia, take us through your first book that you want okay. to choose. Well, Tony, what I'm going to do is to try to lump these three together. Okay. Um, I decided to go with an international approach this time and because I got hooked on some books. Um, my first place when I go to the library is always the new book section to see what I might be able to find there. And the first book that I chose is Oliver Sacks' Oaxaca Journal. And Oliver Sacks is one of my favorite authors. He wrote... Uh, among other things, Awakenings, which was made into a movie with Robert De Niro and uh, Robin Williams, who looks remarkably like him. And The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, and I also read his autobiography called Uncle Tungsten, where he had this uncle who was a chemist, and his mother, in fact, that is Oliver Sacks' mother, let him do wild chemistry experiments in the kitchen. He almost blew the wall out. <laughs> so he had a really remarkable upbringing. But this book, Oaxaca Journal, is about a trip he took to Oaxaca on a field trip with a bunch of botanists who love ferns. 
And I thought, this man just has all kinds of interests. And so I read that, and in the back I discovered that this was part of a collection uh, that, um, a series rather, that the National Geographic Society has put together, and which happened to be in our very fine North Idaho College Library, <laughs> probably thanks to Denise Clark. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> and so I did read Oaxaca Journal, and then I, the second book I read was Crete by Barry Unsworth, and that one I read because I'd been to Crete. and. I just was so excited to find passages in there about places I had seen and wanted to go again. And then I found Francine Prose's Sicilian Odyssey, all about Sicily, and I learned so much about that. And my goal is to read all of them in the series. But um, one of the passages I thought I would pick is from Oliver Sacks' book, Oaxaca Journal. Uh, he talks a lot about all the ferns that they find and what it's like a great treasure hunt and they find new ones and one man almost loses his life crawling out on a cliff to find a fern. But he also writes about the whole area and about the food there. And so I thought I would pull out this one section where he is um, in a town where they are distilling mescal. And they um, <clears throat> cook the stems and a he says a mule is used to pull this round stone that's a millstone. Then the mash is put into large vats to ferment. It bubbles heavy bubbles of carbon dioxide and starts to become alcoholic. The bubbly mass is then cooked in a large copper kettle for three hours in the distillate collected below. The particular distillers we are visiting make straight mezcal, which is 98 proof, almost 50% alcohol, and pechuga, mezcal flavored with by raw chicken breasts. <laughs> This is a more delicate in taste and highly esteemed, but the idea of raw chicken breasts disturbs me here, a mixing of categories as with the notion, for example, of fish-flavored gin. And on he goes to tell about this powerful drink that they're making there uh, in Oaxaca. You know, it could be a health problem eating raw chicken. <laughs> yeah, I, know. I think the medical field would worry well, about that. It was that. pretty that well pickled. Fascinating, and I have some other questions for all panels, but we do have two other books that are on the table. And we'll go back to Denise. Denise, you had one other you didn't get to talk about, and we'll... Well, I have this of Walter Isaacson's Benjamin Franklin, An Intimate Life, uh, or an, an, an American Life, rather. Um, I, ha I, I have to admit, this is the, not the type of reading I normally pick up. Um, and, but I, my father kept calling me and saying, you have to read this book, you have to read this book. You know, my father and I share a lot of interests, in reading interests, and so I said, finally, okay, okay. <laughs> Just so I can talk to you about this book, I'll read it. <laughs> and I found this absolutely fascinating. So your father was right. I, my father was right, <laughs> absolutely right. I said, I will, from now on, I'll take your word, Pop. This is a fine read. Uh, Benjamin Franklin was even a more interesting character than I had known. I, I knew he was a bit of an eccentric and a, a rather um, um, a, a, a man who was very broad-minded, you know, for his, uh, for his time. Uh, they said that when he died that uh, every denomination came out to take part in the funeral of Cortez, the Jewish organizations in, in the colonies. Uh, were represented, and so uh, he he seemed he was a, a, just a very, uh, uh, as I said, a very broad-minded man, and with a variety of interests, an, an amazing variety. A man who kept remaking himself, it seems. Also, a man rather difficult to um, quite get a handle on. He's a rather slippery character. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I I enjoyed this book tremendously, and I would say he's probably one of the more interesting self-made um, characters from uh, our past. Thank you. Yeah. Virginia, you have one other one there too. I did. Well, this was my other big read of the summer um, by someone else whose works I really enjoy, Paul Theroux. And this was another trying to retrace my own steps a little bit. It's called Dark Star Safari. Um, and I have been to East Africa, so I thought, well, I'll just see what he has to say about it. The subtitle was Overland from Cairo to Cape Town. And so he began in Cairo and went by everything but airplane. He ruled that out from down to Cape Town. And so he was in buses and carts and motorcycles and bicycles and on foot a little bit of the way. And I have to share with you that I didn't have a desire to go back to Nairobi after I read this. It had mm. apparently become a really terrible slum. But he does write about um, some of the I guess I picked another passage about food, sort of uh, just mm -hmm. as he's describing when he's uh, near Lake Victoria. And uh, he said, when clouds covered the moon, I looked around the train 
and found a dining car and some Africans inside already drunk. Must have drinking on my mind, too. Uh, the attendant asked me in Swahili if I was hungry, and to tempt me, he showed me some heaped plates saying, Chakula, Chakula, food, food. To the novice, this was, quote, mystery meat. But I knew better. One dish was obviously a purple ambugus pie. The others were a stack of crumbobulous cutlets and some gosky patties, all of which I recognized from the book of Nonsense Cookery by Edward Lear. The cutlets were done to perfection, the recipe having been followed closely. When the whole is thus minced, brush it hastily with a new clothes brush. The attendant kept waving them in my face, yet I declined. Just a beer, I said. <laughs> so he recognizes that the food might not be so great. Um, but he does go down the Nile, and I thought it interesting that all the time he was in Cairo, people kept saying, well, where are you going? And he said, well, he, said, he, he would tell them that he's journeying in Africa, and they would say, well, when are you going to begin? And he kept saying, but I am in Africa, aren't I? I'm in Egypt. And they said, oh, no, that's not really Africa. <laughs> <laughs> but I had always wanted to go up the Nile, and he describes it as a very beautiful uh, scene, traveling on the Nile with the, the river, he says, was a mirror of all this, the sky, the banks, the boats, the animals, a brimming reflection of everything near and far, an ambitious aquarelle that took in a whole visible, peaceful landscape. So he has the really broad distinctions of all the places. You had a lot of reading this summer on food. <laughs> uh, yes, unusual food, <laughs> unusual food, mystery meat, and <laughs> that chicken part breast. Of your menu. <laughs> uh, this is wonderful. And uh, Fran, back to you. Uh, you indicated it was very moving in your presentation. I have this very same question for Annie. Both of you in the classroom, mm -hmm. um, as you do your non-fictional reading such as this, you do it for your own edification, your own pleasure and all, but you also find, do you not, that you can use it in such places as the classroom. As you select your nonfiction, what are some of the criteria you use to do that? Well, probably one of the most important ones is uh, if Virginia and Denise and Annie have read it and <laughs> if they can give me the thumbs up on it. Um, but I am, I am especially fond of humor especially if it has in it some message that's deeper and more poignant and more meaningful. Uh, I think that those kinds of approaches to writing are ones that will be lasting for people, anyone who reads them. And my students always, always appreciate that kind of writing the most. If someone can make you laugh and bring you to tears in the space of three or four pages, then that person's a good writer. It's a reflection of life in yes. so many ways. Mm -hmm. And Annie, how do you choose? And how, does that, at times, also connect with your classes? Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm with Virginia. I choose a lot of times by just making some excuse to go over to the library and then just having to go over to the new book section, and you never know what you're going to find over there. But um, the Helen Thomas book I actually um, chose because I do teach the mass media in our society class here, mm -hmm. and I find myself... I, I've said I feel like a Jeopardy person the other day. I was just like quoting her like right and left. I mean, the student could bring up something. I said, well, Helen Thomas says that, you know. <laughs> so, and right now there is um, Walter Cronkite's books on my shelf to read. Uh, David Brinkley's on my shelf to read because I, I really like their uh, reflections on life. And also it's a way of, of learning about our history without a history book, I guess. And there's a lot of that. Uh, and there's... A book out by is it Brokaw, I believe, that uh, deals with the greatest generation, he says, of World War II, you know, mm -hmm. and the sacrifices. Mm -hmm. And that's really getting great reviews. Uh, Denise, back to you. Uh, I know I ask a question I ask every year, but we have some new viewers. Uh, when do you find time? And I know what your story <laughs> is, but our viewers would like to know that. When, you know, one's busy in life, but uh, as many books as all of you read, uh, you can get a lot read by just doing a little at a time, can you not? I can get a lot read a little at a time. I have probably right now at least four, maybe five different books in various stages of you know, having been read in about every room in the house. I have a book in my bedroom. I have a book in the TV room. I have a paperback in the kitchen. So when I'm cooking, it doesn't matter you know, what, you know, what I splatter on it. Except that I'll send them to my mother who will open them up and look at them and said, say, oh, I see you were making brownies when you, <laughs> you, know, when you read them. As long as it doesn't cover the, the, the words themselves. You know, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, so. But, um, I usually choose to read over television, so, so it's just background. So noise. it's background noise if it's even on. Yeah. So. 
Yeah, that's not good advice to students, you know, watch TV <laughs> while you study. Uh, Virginia, what's your reading habits? And uh, you read more than one at a time? I do, and I seem to get on, uh, oh yes, I definitely have more than one at a time. I have one in the living room, one in my bedroom, one in the dining room, in the kitchen, in yes. The kitchen. Uh, do you ever get splattered. these confused about what's in I, each book? Sometimes I do. <laughs> it, I have a couple of fiction books that are sort of mixed up in my head. But I also go on tears. Like I started, as I said, I, I picked out the Oaxaca Journal, and then I thought, well, there's more than one in this series, so mm -hmm. I'll just try to read all of them. But I got sidetracked because when I got to, for example, Barry Unsworth, what happened is when they asked the authors in this series to write, they chose famous writers. So then I thought, well, I haven't read anything by Barry Unsworth either. Mm -hmm. So then I got off on that sidetrack. And the same with like uh, <laughs> Francine Prose, yes. And yeah, reading at so, it. And then the one leads me to another, to sure. another, and so I stop, and then someone will say, have you read that? And I say no, and so, yeah. yes, that's why I have several going. And did you read more than one at a time? You know, I'm not, I'm not a big multitasker, I guess. That I sometimes have a couple going. I usually I'll have a fiction and a nonfiction going. Like right now I have Al Franklin's book going, and it's just kind of fun yeah. to read a chapter of that and stuff. But I read almost always. I just finish dinner, and my husband turns on the TV, and then he falls asleep, and then I mute the TV, and then <laughs> I read for about two hours. And oh, that's a great combination. <laughs> yeah. Fran, how do you read? In bed, usually. Uh, my husband gets so frustrated because he'll, he'll come up to go to bed because he's watching TV and I go to bed so I can read. But I'll have stacks all around me and I've got my magazines and my New Yorker and I have to read that. And then I have my art books because I read a lot about art. And then, of course, I have my novel and I'll have one or two of them. And I fall asleep with the book, you know, <laughs> on my face or wherever Somebody it happens to be. they'll find you, uh, the late Fran, with all the books. On yeah, the smothered. <laughs> uh, she went out with uh, enjoying her book. Yeah. Yes. Well, this is a wonderful, wonderful program, and you are so great to come. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we've enjoyed having our four colleagues to deal with nonfiction books. This is a, a sample of the kind of books they've read. And, and we hope that you will uh, do those. I hope they'll put up on the screen the uh, email for uh, Denise Clark, and she can tell you uh, about these. It's gone up on the screen now. And uh, if you contact her, uh, actually, you might, uh, Denise, give um, uh, what the email address is. Uh, my email address is Denise underscore Clark. And that's C-L-A-R-K. K at N-I-C dot E-D-U. And you're always so gracious to answer and all questions I will and give advice. Any questions. And even books we didn't talk about here. Ladies and gentlemen, please be with us again next week at the same time. Until then, have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest running in house college production on PBS. Each episode is pre recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station.